Thank you, Lisa. It's my pleasure to introduce Judge Alice Batchelder. Judge Batchelder began her professional career as a school teacher, which is acutely apparent to those like me who had the pleasure of clerking for her, because we frequently received lessons not only in the law, but in grammar. <laughs> Judge Batchelder finished first in her class at the University of Akron Law School and served as the editor-in-chief of the Law Review. She did so at a time when there were few women in the law. Despite having the very top grades in her class, she did not get the award for being first in her class, which was given instead to a male student who had inferior grades because, well, he was a man and the award would be helpful to him in, in acquiring a respectable job. As luck would have it, Judge Batchelder achieved a respectable job. <laughs> After a successful career in private practice, Batchelder became a judge on the U.S. Bankruptcy Court for the Northern District of Ohio in 1983. After two years, Ronald Reagan appointed her to the U.S. District Court for the Northern District of Ohio. Now, it was not until law school that I learned that bankruptcy judges were Article I courts, or bankruptcy courts were Article I courts, and bankruptcy judges were not Article III judges while reading Northern Pipeline Construction Company versus Marathon pipeline company. But the distinction between Article I and Article III courts was something that Judge Batchelder's elementary school age son, Billy, knew far too well. Upon hearing that his mother had been nominated by Reagan and confirmed to the district court, he asked, does this mean that you are a real judge now? <laughs> <laughs> to this day, Judge Batchelder's clerk, clerks fondly refer to her by the corresponding nickname RJ, real judge. In 1991, President George Bush appointed her to the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Sixth Circuit. From August 2009 to August 2014, Judge Batchelder served as Chief Judge of the Sixth Circuit Court of Appeals, and as most of you know, she took senior status just last month. Uh, Judge Batchelder serves on the Board of Trustees for Grove City College, from which she received an honorary Doctor of Law in 2009. She's received countless honorary degrees and lifetime achievement awards, including notably the prestigious Defender of the Constitution Award from the Heritage Foundation and the Claremont Institute's Ronald Reagan Jurisprudence Award, as well as the Sir Thomas More Award from the Catholic Diocese of Cleveland in conjunction with the Akron Bar Association. She is married to William G. Batchelder III, longtime Ohio legislator and former speaker of the Ohio, the Ohio House of Representatives, and while always impartial on the bench, Judge Batchelder makes no effort to be objective about her two wonderful adult children, their wonderful spouses, and eight grandchildren whom she adores. Now, at the Federalist Society, we host countless debates on many topics, but on the question of the proper role of the judiciary, we all agree. It is emphatically the province of the judiciary to say what the law is, not what it should be. Consider then Judge Batchelder's own statement on the proper role of a judge, which she offered as her Constitution Day lecture at the Ashbrook Center a few years ago. Quote, when faced with a tough constitutional case, the judge's job is not to determine the preferred policy outcome, but to determine whether the claim falls inside or outside the scope of the Constitution. And this, I would submit to you, is a narrow function. There have been a lot of times in my years as a judge when I didn't like the outcome that the law required but it was not my place to substitute my policy choice for that of the legislators who drafted those laws, to impose will instead of judgment. Instead, my job was to hold my nose and decide. And I did that. And I'm still doing that. In Ohio, for the past 36 years, we've been privileged to witness an icon in the law, Judge Alice Batchelder, who served and continues to serve as the standard bearer for what a constitutionalist judge should be. But you don't need to take my word for it. Former Attorney General Edwin Meese III has lauded Judge Batchelder as a model and the gold standard for precisely the kind of judge that President Ronald Reagan sought to appoint to the bench, judges who seek to apply the law rather than arrive at their own preferred policy preferences. Or take the sentiment of her good friend and colleague Judge Sutton, who commented upon Judge Batchelder's receipt of the Sir Thomas More Award, quote, I have lost count of the number of times her steadfast efforts have prompted me to look anew at a case for the, for the good of the court and for the good of the law, end quote. Judge Sutton joins us here this morning along with two other of his and Judge Batchelder's new colleagues on the United States Court of Appeals for the Sixth Circuit, Chad Radler and Eric Murphy, uh, who have all come to honor Judge Batchelder here today. 
So with that, please join me, Judges Sutton, Radler, and Murphy, in welcoming to the stage a national treasure, a real judge, Judge Alice Batchelder. start out this morning by st setting the record straight. Um, I wasn't in expecting to be introduced with such a large helping of, well, we won't say. But, um, it's a real pleasure to be here this morning, however, and particularly at such a civilized starting time. Uh, I didn't realize the Federalist Society was so good at not making people get up at 7.30 in the morning or worse. Um, but really, I'm here this morning uh, sort of in the role of the opener, you know, the band that plays first, just before the guys that you bought the tickets to come and see. <laughs> That's me. Um, and so when I was thinking about what I should say this morning, having wondered a little bit why I agreed to do this, um, my first instinct was to do something substantive that would bear on the topics that are going to be discussed today, and I think it's really going to be a, a very interesting uh, day, but I abandoned that for a couple of reasons. Uh, and the first one was that although this is a very civilized hour, probably you, like me, or at least many of you, have only had one cup of coffee so far, and that probably doesn't put you in scholarly mode. Um, but secondly, when I looked at the program, I realized that this is a very diverse program that's being presented today. Um, and kudos to the people who arranged this program, by the way, because the Federalist Society isn't widely touted for its interest in diversity, um, at least uh, not by those who view us as the greatest threat to the judiciary since FDR failed to pack the Supreme Court. Um, <laughs> but there wasn't any obvious theme underlying the, the three panels here today, so I, just started, I decided I would start instead after pointing out to Robert that that really was over the top, um, uh, by welcoming any new judges who might be here, and any judges in waiting, particularly of the federal variety, who are still enduring what I used to call the greatest euphemism of all time, the judicial selection process. Um, that's the process in which you learn that soon means sometime between now and your natural death. But I digress. It's always dangerous to try to name the, the people like the new judges, and so I'm not going to do that, except to single out Eric Murphy, um, because Eric, by getting confirmed to the Sixth Circuit, you have made me a senior judge. Thank you very much. Um, I know that I'm now officially old, but it's worth it. Um, to Eric uh, and to Chad Radler, when I was first confirmed on the Sixth Circuit, I got a call from Judge John Peck, who was then a senior judge on the circuit, resident in Cincinnati, and after congratulating me, he said, I hope that you will enjoy this as much as I have, but I have to tell you, there's a reason that no one will ever make a movie about the life of an appellate court judge. <laughs> well, I've been doing this for 27, on this court, for 27 years now, and I can confirm that. It's true, but I would also say that um, I've come close a couple of times. Uh, once as an appellate judge, um, a couple of years ago, they actually made a movie uh, about a case that I wrote the opinion for, um, a case that we always, in my chambers, referred to as the Transylvania Knuckleheads, um, which was probably not very politic, but it certainly was true. Um, the, the movie is actually called American Animals, and it tells about four really seriously lame-brained college kids who tried to execute very poorly um, a heist of rare antique books from the Transylvania College Library. Um, the movie didn't hang around very long in the theaters, so I never got a chance to see it, uh, although Danny Boggs did. Um, but I, I didn't find out whether it includes the knuckleheads' attempts to uh, get their criminal convictions reversed their unsuccessful attempts 
to get those reversed. Um, but if the movie doesn't mention the great appellate panel, I, I can't imagine why. Um, <laughs> and the other one doesn't really qualify because I wasn't quite yet an appellate judge. I was still on the district court. Um, it actually never made it to the big screen so far as I know, although there were some newspaper articles about the possibility. Um, but that was the story of Timmy the gorilla. The Cleveland Zoo had decided that they wanted to send Timmy to the Bronx to become a father. Timmy seemed to be agnostic on the matter, um, but various animal rights groups were definitely not and were outraged at the idea that Timmy would be separated from his wife, Kate. Um, it was definitely a missed opportunity for Hollywood, and if anybody wants to know that story, see me afterwards. Um, <laughs> but turning to the act that I'm warming you up for, um, I feel pretty confident in saying that neither the Federalists nor the group that I tend to relate to a lot more, the Anti-Federalists, uh, likely foresaw the issues that today's panels uh, will be covering. With regard to the partisan gerrymandering issue, um, the Constitution doesn't say anything about whether partisan politics either may or may not factor into the drawing of congressional districts. In fact, it doesn't say anything about congressional districts. Um, and even if the Federalists and the Anti-Federalists had foreseen the 14th Amendment, they would not, I think, have anticipated the possibility that the courts would decide that politically drawn districts are unconstitutional or that the courts, rather than the states or Congress, to whom it is given in Article I the responsibility for prescribing the times, places, and manner of holding elections, would uh, draw the districts. Um, maybe the greatest anti-federalist, except for Patrick Henry, um, Brutus, said the judicial are not only to decide questions arising upon the meaning of the Constitution in law, but in equity. By this, they are empowered to explain the Constitution according to the reasoning spirit of it without being confined to the words or letter, and in their decisions, they will not confine themselves to any fixed or established rules, but will determine, according to what appears to them, the reason and spirit of the Constitution. Well, of course, the Federalist, Alexander Hamilton, said that was ridiculous. Uh, he said, there is not a syllable in the plan which directly empowers the national courts to construe the laws according to the spirit of the Constitution. Right. Brutus, tweet. And I really don't know what the Federalists would have said had they been able to foresee the fourth branch of government uh, and the Supreme Court's conferring of enormous deference on those agencies. But I have no doubt what the Anti-Federalists would have said. Although the Anti-Federalists certainly did not devote nearly as much ink to the executive branch as they did to the other two, they made some general observations that are certainly, uh, had they known about it, would have been aimed uh, in that direction. Here's Brutus again. There can be no free government where the people are not possessed of the power of making the laws by which they are governed, either in their own persons or by others substituted in their stead, by which, of course, Brutus meant their elected representatives. Uh, I think it's fair to say Brutus would not be very happy with the Code of Federal Regulations. Um, and whenever I'm talking about agencies, I always, I can rarely resist the opportunity to throw in a story which has no relation to this whatsoever, um, <laughs> but it's one that I really love. So when our kids were little, we were in Washington, and our daughter was about five, and we're driving down, I don't know, one of the, I hate Washington, so I never know where I am when I'm there. Um, so we're driving down one of the big streets, you know, through all of these enormous federal buildings, and we stopped for a traffic light, and my daughter, who was about five at the time, said, Daddy, Daddy, you promised you'd show us a bureaucrat. <laughs> Bill says, you're right, Lil, I did. Oh, okay, look, see that guy in the gray suit just starting across the street? He's a bureaucrat. Elizabeth said, but Daddy, he looks just like everybody else. And Bill said, yes, and that's why he is so dangerous. <laughs> <laughs> and finally, the religious liberty issue. 
The Anti-Federalists opposed the Constitution in no small part because it did not contain a Bill of Rights, including protection of religious freedom. And they believed, as many of the Federalists did, certainly John Adams, that if this form of government which was being proposed uh, was to succeed at all, it would only be in the hands of a moral and religious people. Now, I have no doubt at all that neither the Federalists nor the Anti-Federalists foresaw, for example, the kind of conflicts presented to the courts in the Tree of Life Christian schools or in Masterpiece Cake Shop. For that matter, I can only imagine how they might have responded to the idea of RELUPA. And I, I know that I did just say finally, um, but now I really mean finally. Um, this last observation is not readily called to mind by today's diverse program, but it's one that I can't resist sticking in because I think it would be fair to say that in their wildest nightmares, neither the Federalists nor the Anti-Federalists could ever have foreseen something like this coming. Remember that Madison said in Federalist 78 that a voluminous code of laws is one of the inconveniences necessarily connected with the advantages of a free government, and hence there can be but few men in the society who will have sufficient skill in the laws to qualify them for the stations of judges. Well, note, first of all, of course, that he didn't foresee women in those positions. Um, but what he also did not foresee, I bet, is the plethora of laws like this one. For purposes of paragraph three, an organization described in paragraph two shall be deemed to include an organization described in section 501c, 4, 5, or 6, which would be described in paragraph two if it were an organization described in section 501c, 3. <laughs> really? And the last time I looked, which I will admit was before the most recent um, changes in the code, uh, that was at 26 U.S.C. section 509A, if anybody wants to look it up and see if it's still there. Um, well, like you, I am very much looking forward to today's program. Uh, and I learned many years ago that a speaker's popula popularity is often inversely proportionate to the length of her speech. So I am going to close down now and leave everybody time for another cup of coffee, perhaps, before the next speaker starts. Thank you. Thank you.